Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about how water affects jet engines. Do they have any effect at all? And can you actually use water to increase the thrust of a jet engine? Stay tuned. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org will help you understand the kind of things that I'm talking about in today's video. The 500 first of you who uses this link here below will get 20% off the annual fee with Brilliant, but it's completely free to check it out, and I suggest that you do just that. Right, guys. So, jet engines and water is a fascinating thing to talk about. Uh, the reason I'm talking about it at all is because I received a question from one of you guys who sent in, how does water actually affect jet engines? Uh, is it dangerous to fly an aircraft when it's raining outside? And in that case, why? Um, so, I love to answer questions that comes in from you guys. So, continue to send in your comments, your suggestions, your thumbs up. It really, really helps the channel. But to get to the point, um, water, specifically rain, doesn't really affect jet engines to any bigger extent. Now, water on the runways is a different thing. So, when it's raining outside, the uh, runways and the taxiways become wet. That decreases the braking coefficient, the friction of the runway. And since we need to be able to both take off on the available runway and stop in case we would have an engine failure um, at or close to V1, well then, the braking coefficient is really important. So, when the runway is wet, we, have, we need more thrust to take off than on a dry runway. So, yes, to a certain extent, water does have an effect there. But when it comes to rain itself, the engine manufacturers are primarily concerned with uh, something called a flameout. Now, a flameout of a jet engine is when the engine, you know, has a burn chamber. I'm going to go through how a jet engine works in just a second. But that's when the flame inside of the burn chamber flames out without any real anything wrong with the engine. So the engine is mechanically working perfectly, but for one reason or another, the engine flames out. Okay, and this is something that the engine manufacturers pay a lot of attention to when they make a new engine. Um, so when a new engine is being constructed, part of the certification, the testing of that engine, is for them to actually stand with big water hoses, as in fire hoses, and spray that straight into the jet engine to make sure that it's not affected by that. Okay, and that is going to be far, far more water than will ever be injected through rain, even if it's very heavy rain. Okay, now the way the jet engine works is that on modern jet engines, the very first part that you'll see is the big fan. Okay, the big fan works kind of like a shield when it comes to rain and hail and things like that. It means that the biggest droplets will hit the fan, and because of centrifugal forces, when the engine, sorry, the fan is spinning quickly, the uh, water will then go out towards the side of the fan and will follow the bypass duct or the bypass air out and past the core of the engine. Okay. Now, some of these droplets, they will go into the engine. And the first thing that they will come across there is the different compressor stages. These are basically like small fans inside of the engine that compresses the air down until it has the correct temperature and pressure to be entered into the burn chambers of the engine. The, the way that it works, if you know your physics, is that as air, war, as, as air is being compressed, the temperature will rise. So the water droplets that goes into the compressor stages will be turned into water vapor very, very quickly. And the water vapor will be so small part of the overall um, air volume that it doesn't affect the, uh, the, the burn chambers at all. You have to understand that the amount of air that's being sucked into a jet engine on every, every given second is about the volume of a normal house. So a jet engine, if I would put that into the wall here and it would be on normal thrust, it will suck all of the air out of the entire house in one second. So a tiny little bit of water vapor will have a very, very small effect on the engine itself. So water doesn't have any effect on the thrust and a very minimal risk to flame out of the engine. 
Now, after the burn chambers, we'll be coming something called a uh, turbine. Okay, that is also several stages of fans that's running in the opposite direction. And they are actually the things that takes out some of the energy from the, um, from the air that's being expelled to run the compressors and the fan. So fan, compressors, burn chambers, turbines, and then the air is expelled out. The thrust is being created mainly by the bypass air. So that huge fan in front of the engine is what's, what's um, producing most of the jet engine's thrust. But some of the thrust is also being produced by the, uh, the high speed jet that's being expelled from the engine in itself. All right. Now, what could cause a flame out is if we, uh, for whatever reason, would fly into a thunderstorm. Because inside of a thunderstorm, you will have things like hail and potentially icing conditions and extremely high amounts of water. So very, very heavy rain. And if you have all those three things combined, you might have hail that will be damaging the, uh, the fan and might be being sucked in and damage some of the compressor blades. That might cause a difference in, in, in air flow inside of the engine, might cause the engine to stall and it might let through more water than it's designed to take and that might um, cause a flame out. That has happened back in the 1980s. We had uh, a few occasions where a 737 had dual engine flame out because they flew into thunderstorms at low thrust settings. Because the thrust setting was low, then there was now less speed, there was less um, air flowing through, and it was also a lower temperature inside of the, uh, the burn chamber. And that, together with all of the things that I've just discussed, caused the flame out in itself. Now, the engines are constructed to relight. If they would have a flame out, we have two igniters in each engine. They work kind of like the igniters in, in your car, but much, much stronger. And if you've seen cockpit videos, you'd have seen that any time that we go into icing condition of any sort, the first thing we do is we put the engine start switches in the cockpit to continuous. Okay? Those start switches are actually the igniters. So when we put them to continuous, that ignites one of the igniters in each engine. And it goes continuously. That's to help in case there would be uh, water, too much water, whatever being ingested, that helps the burn process. When the start switches are off, there's actually no igniters on. The, f the, the flame in itself keeps feeding the flame. If we would be in really bad conditions, very, very bad turbulence, very, very bad um, precipitation, for example, or we do get into a hailstorm, uh, then, or even if we would have dual engine failure, then we put the engine start switch to flight. And what that does is that it ignites both igniters inside of each engine. Okay, with me so far? Cool. So flying into thunderstorms is something that we really, really want to avoid. Now, I've mentioned this in many of my previous videos as well. Uh, this is why we have weather radars, so that we constantly monitoring, make sure that there's no thunderstorms or bad weather in front of us. We also plan for this on the planning stage before the flight to make sure to avoid them. And we have very specific rules as to how close to a thunderstorm that we can get. And that is because of things like icing, hail, and enormous amount of water being ingested. Okay, cool. Right, so I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, what about using water to actually increase the thrust? Has that ever been done? That does happen in cars, for example. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, in modern jet engines, we do not do that. But in the older type of low bypass ratio engines and turbo jet engines, um, the fact was that they weren't really effective. They weren't really strong. And during the takeoff, for example, they needed an extra push in order to produce the amount of thrust needed to get the aircraft off the ground. So the older jet engines, for example, the, uh, the jet engines that were fitted onto the 737-200, they had something called a water injection system. And what that was, was that it was um, a tank of water that was there only to be able to inject water directly into the burn chambers or into the compressor stage just prior to the burn chambers in a controlled way. And what that did was that it added to the overall um, amount, or the overall volume of uh, mass that was being thrown out by the jet engine. All right? And 
if you know your, uh, your physics, you know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This is how reaction engines works. This is how jet engines works. So by adding water vapor, a lot of water vapor and mass, it meant that they got more thrust, but only for a limited time. And also a secondary effect, which was almost equally important, was that by doing this, just enough, not enough to actually quench the flame, but enough to cool the flame down, they could lower the exhaust gas temperature. That would save the turbines and all of the components that came after the burn chambers, because that's actually the thing that is, uh, that is limiting on a jet engine. It's the, it's the heat that is being produced that can't be high, you know, it can't be higher than what the, the actual components can take. But by lowering the heat, by adding water, you could lower the exhaust gas temperature and therefore you could add more fuel and even more volume being exposed. So that had a secondary effect, of course, as well. And that was when you'd throw water into, uh, into a fire, that would cool down the fire. And that happens exactly the same in a jet engine. So the, um, the actual burn chambers would burn at lower temperature and that would mean a less effective um, burn, which meant that the, when this was in use, when you, when you saw an aircraft taking off with a water injection in force, they would leave these huge black plumes of smoke with unburned fuel inside of them. So not very environmentally friendly, but it did do the job. It did increase the thrust that you could take out of the engine. So yes, water injection systems have been used, but they're not being used in, uh, in modern jet engines because we have the fans that produces much more thrust and it would be extremely inefficient and very un environmentally unfriendly to use the water injection system. So basically, that's what I had when it came to rain and water and how that affects jet engines. If you have more questions of this, I want you to send it in here. I do read your comments, okay? I want you to send a like if you like the video and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Because if you don't, you might not know when I'm, you know, for example, uh, doing a live stream or when I put out a video, um, a bonus video for you to follow. I also want to send a huge thank you to the sponsor of this video, which is brilliant.org. Now, if you, like me, were struggling with maths and physics in school and didn't think it was interesting at all, well then, Brilliant is a brilliant tool for you guys to use, okay? They will make it fun and interesting to, um, to learn maths. They will give you different sorts of... Uh, problems to solve, they will help you to solve them if you can't, and they will constantly bring you higher in your knowledge level. This is why I'm so happy to have Brilliant as a sponsor to my videos, because I know that what they do will help you achieve your goals. So check out this link, the 501st of you who does so will get 20% off the annual fee, but once again, it's free to check them out. Now guys, if you're interested in, you know, generally, seeing how we deal with different problems. How, for example, we would handle a TCAS maneuver, as in avoiding to crash into another aircraft, or a Category 3 ILS approach that we do when it's heavy fog, or indeed an engine failure after takeoff. Well, then I highly recommend you to get the Mentor Aviation app, okay? The app is completely free to download for you, but inside of the app, I have made these kind of uh, training, instruction videos that you can use. Those ones cost a little bit of money that I use, to keep improving the app. Uh, and you can see it in 360. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad or an Android device, you can either move the screen around and you can see what's going on, or you can swipe to see everything. So if I'm pointing at a specific switch, you can look at that, okay? Uh, there are also chats available inside of the free part of the app. Um, there are videos that I recommend you guys to see to increase your knowledge. And there's loads of things. I'm trying to make that app into a a great forum for anyone who's interested in aviation, be it a student pilot, professional pilot like me, or just an aviation enthusiast, to bring kind of a window into the world that we live. So get the Mentor Aviation app, it's completely free to download. I have the links to both Android and iOS here in the description of the video. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Money.